Hello and welcome back to the fourth and final part of this series where I will be teaching you how to draw a realistic dog using charcoal and we will be wrapping up the entire drawing in this series. My name is Adam O and I'm the founder of Midwest Guild of Fine Art. Today we're going to be dropping in the body and the background. There will be varying layers of focus as we go from the dog's head to the body to the background. And as we get further back into the image, we will put less and less detail. So right now, I'm, I'm dropping in some of the darkest parts of the dog's body. There, there is sort of a, a really dark, almost black shadow and a, a dark splotch of fur that covers most of uh, the middle of her body. And this shadow is one of the things that's going to make the head pop out quite a bit because since we're going to have a really dark splotch right here in the middle, then the glowing part of the fur that's on the top left hand side of her head is going to glow that much more because there's a very heavy contrast between those two areas. So what I'm doing is I'm loading up a Q-tip very, very heavy and I'm scrubbing that in uh, but you'll see in a moment that's not quite black enough. And so what I'm going to do is uh, just take a, a straight up pencil. Uh, I think I use extra soft charcoal here and I'm going to scrub in a little bit of that area and then I'm going to go back and blend that with the Q-tip itself because I can't quite get it black enough by using just the Q-tip. Now one thing you've got to be careful about if you're going to use this technique of, of using a pencil and then scrubbing with a Q-tip on top of it is that you don't want to push too hard with the pencil and you're also wanting to, to scrub kind of, um, how do I put this, with short strokes because if you use really long strokes you're going to have a bunch of uh, white pinholes poking through and the Q-tip does a good job of blending that stuff together, but it doesn't fully take them out. So what will happen is if you use your pencil to drop in some of these dark areas and then scrub it with a Q-tip, it will still look a little bit grainy. Now on this particular photo, this particular drawing, there are some areas that we can get away with that because we kind of want it to look like an out of focus photograph or um, maybe an old school type of picture. So that graininess can actually help us a little bit here. But in most cases, you don't really want that graininess uh, because it adds too much texture. The texture we want is flowing fur. The texture that this particular method gives me is more uh, grainy like dots. So if you're using this method on somebody's face and say they have a well, let's say a five o'clock shadow or they've got a really rough skin texture this can really help you out if you're doing dark photos for something like that um, it's actually rare that i use this method on an animal Now since we don't have a lot of landmarks to work with here, since everything is basically just big splotches of gray, I need to kind of get an outline going. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm scrubbing in with pencil the darkest areas of this dark splotch 
And you can see I started on the left hand side to give myself an outline because since I don't have landmarks or a lot of landmarks to work off of, I need to work with um, sort of an outline. I need to lay in landmarks where I can. And so in this particular area, I'm kind of just scrubbing out the outline of the area. Then I'm going to fill it in with pencil very lightly and very roughly. And now I'm going to go uh, back through with a Q-tip and you'll notice that I'm using circular motions to blend it and using those circular motions is what helps fill in the white pinholes that are left from uh, pencil that's used on rough paper and make sure that the the divots the tiny little almost microscopic divots in the paper get filled in from each side whenever you're making circles Now using the dirtied up Q-tip, I can go through and lay in darker shadows and then scrub to lighter areas as the Q-tip loses more and more charcoal. That way I have a gradient there. The darker stuff comes off first, then the lighter stuff naturally gets lighter because you're basically cleaning the Q-tip off as you scrub. Now, to make sure that this area, the shadow, it looks blurry, the most important part is the outside edge. It needs to fade into the rest of the drawing. So what I'm doing is I'm going along the outside edge of this shadow and I'm scrubbing in circles and pulling it into the next area. And that's going to be the same with every single shadow we do from here on out in the background. We'll put in the shadow, then we will use circle, circular motions to kind of give a fuzzy edge to every shadow and it will look like an out of focus camera when we're all done with it. Now with the background, we're doing something just a tiny bit different than, than the process we used for the face. On the face, we put in our areas, then refined, then uh, adjusted, then refined, over and over and over. We're going to do that much more quickly with the background because the background here should look rough and um, it should look not nearly as detailed so we don't have to put in tons of layers of refinement here. The basic thing that we're going to do with the, the background is make sure that our darks are dark enough and our lights are light enough. Otherwise, we're scrubbing this in very quickly. So you'll notice that I, I tend to drop in my areas. Then if they need darkened, I go ahead and darken them. But I do it quickly and I move on. We're not going to spend a ton of time on this background stuff because it's not a focal point. Now using those same short strokes with a Q-tip, I'm going to lay in some more gradients along the dog's leg. Um, and it's just going to be a, a mid-tone gray blob. We're using short strokes because it can still give the illusion of sort of a, a short type of fur. Because you're not going to have a perfectly smooth gradient. You're going to have some scratches and lines that kind of pop in uh, here and there because the q-tip is imperfect 
It's not a perfectly round, fluffy tip. There are going to be little stray hairs and little knotted balls and stuff that appear as you scrub. And those little uh, imperfections will make tighter lines appear kind of at random. Those are fine. We want to make sure that we blend those out once they're in. But those little additional uh, dark scratches and splotches will look that the it will make the fur look more natural. And so it's totally fine to have those in there. We just need to make sure that we're doing two things. One, we're we're putting in the background, which is that mid-tone gray over the whole area. And two, anytime we have those splotches and those little extra dark lines, we blend them out. But we're not going to really go back with any erasers or anything and take them out. We want those little imperfections to be in there from time to time. Now to help you visualize what I'm doing, you can tell the dog's body starting to come into shape. The area that I'm working on is where her, she's laying down and her back leg is kind of under her. So that's like her haunch. And then the dark splotch that's right in the middle by her ear, that's part of her body. So her body goes back into the distance. And once we get that in, um, we'll be able to concentrate a little bit more on the outside edge of her fur. So like the fur along the neck, you can already tell it's starting to glow. Uh, there will be another spot along the ear. And as we get this background put in, that gives us the room to then go back with a Tombow eraser and sharpen up the hairs that are on the outside of her ears and stuff like that. It'll make them stand out much more because now there's a heavy contrast for that glowing part to be on top of, so it'll stand out a lot more. Now one thing that we want to keep in mind as we're laying in this, uh, this first layer, this background color of the dog's haunches and, and rear end, is that the, she's laying on carpet and there are going to be some shadows that come from the top of the paper down through the middle of the paper because the, the sun is shining behind her through some windows or doors. And so we need the background layer to be there, but it needs to be a little on the light side so that the shadows that are going to be behind her will appear darker. Um, it's just the human brain likes to compare and contrast and it, it really likes to grab a hold of those shadows and recognize them. If the back of the dog is too dark, then the shadows will appear uh, basically the same color or the same tone and you'll lose interest in the drawing. So one of the big things I try to keep in mind whenever I'm doing uh, any sort of portrait is to have heavy contrast in the right areas. Now, as I'm laying in this part on her leg, this uh, the background sort of uh, gray tone, I'm scrubbing it into place, but I'm also at the same time kind of darkening up one of the shadows that's on the top part. It's sort of like that long triangle shaped shadow. And I'm also blending out the sides of that shadow so that it looks out of focus. I'm doing all that at the same time. 
because my Q-tip is already loaded, it makes it easier to blend out the edges and make all that sort of flow into each other. So there's not really a need to lay in the background, then go back and lay in the shadows, then more background, then more shadows. You can do that all at once. You just have to, to be spatially aware of what shadows go where, how dark they are, and you can just lay them in as you're doing the background like I am here. Now, as we get down to the bottom part of the leg, we want to make sure the shadows down there are a little bit darker. As we get to the middle of the leg, it's a little bit lighter in most areas because the leg is rounded and not flat. So if we make a brighter spot right dead center and then get darker in both directions, it will look like the leg curves. That's what gives it that 3D effect. If we make that all the same exact tone, uh, it's going to look flat and two-dimensional. So we need to have this gray fade out in area, areas and get darker in other areas. And the main areas we want to focus on, as far as darkness goes, is the very bottom and around the edges. And then we want it to get lighter toward the middle and toward the top. The top part is what gets more sunlight because that's just naturally the way the light is flowing. The middle part of the leg gets more light because it's curved, so it catches more light at the apex of that curve. And the thing we need to remember here is all these shadows are soft, soft, soft. We don't want any hard line, hard to edge shadows. So if we see any areas that have sharp edges, we're going to go back and take those out with a Q-tip and soften those up, make them fluffy on the edges. Make them blend right into the next area. And the more you blend that and the fuzzier you make it, the more out of focus it will look. Like the only area really that we have that has any sort of edge, and it's barely an edge at all, is that very large dark splotch right in the middle of her body. And that's only because her leg comes up over that. And even then the edge that we have there is very fuzzy and very blended, just not quite as fuzzy and blended as the rest of her leg. We just need to make a separation there so that the brain recognizes that okay this is the middle of the body and there's a thing in front of that that section now the exception to these rules is that we do want hard edges along the face because remember the face is in focus but the background is not but we can sort of fudge that in there once we get that background laid in by going back over the fur with the Tombow eraser and with a smudge stick and we can add sharpness to the face. But that's the one area where we don't really want to soften up the shadows because there is going to be a ton of sharp edges along the edge of the ear and the, the mane and along the, the sides of the face especially on like the top of the head too.
Now this is the very top part of her body and there's a fairly defined section of light there. We still don't want to define it with hard edges um, but we do want there to be a distinction between the very dark splotch in the middle versus this light section that I'm working on now. So what I'm doing is laying in that section as smoothly as possible and then I'm going to go back through and blend it the way we talked about just a minute ago but I want to make sure first that I get the tone correct. Now we can already start to see that the, the body's there. When you look at the picture overall, you can tell it's a dog that's laying and that the hindquarters are going back into the distance. So now that I'm happy with the shape, I'm just going to go back through what I've already laid in and make sure that the little divots and dents that are um, in the actual shape of her body, I want to make sure those are in place. I also want to make sure that I'm taking out a lot of those stroke marks and that's just I, I do that just by blending with circular motions and we just want to make this a little smoother than what it is right now. Now if you're having a problem with your curvy parts with like your leg if you have a problem with those looking too flat the easiest way to fix that is to go along the bottom parts where you got the majority of the shadows and darken those up a bit but not the rest and that will give the illusion of curve then you can look at what you've done and compare that tone that you just laid in the shadows with the rest of the drawing and you can darken up appropriately but if you're ever having a 2D problem and you want to make it look more 3D the solution is almost always found in your outer shadows and especially your bottom shadows Now I've noticed that on top of her ear, going back into her body, I could have that pop out way more if I had a little bit more of that dark area uh, brought in toward the head a little bit, especially where the, the ear meets the head. So you'll see me sort of dragging that dark area over there because whenever I start to, to put a little bit more detail into the glowy parts, it will just pop out a little bit better. Uh, once I have that in place, where it, and it's not much, it's just a little bit. Now I can go down and to the left below where her leg is, and I can start dropping in the darkest of the dark background shadows. Now remember that this section is going to be getting closer to the camera as we go down the page. 
So one of the things I want to do is uh, remember that I'm going to have this out of focus, but not as out of focus as the stuff that's going to happen in the middle of the page and especially at the top of the page. So what I'm doing is I'm dropping in some really dark areas with a pencil first, blending that up into the other shadows, and then I'm going to, going to start outlining a little bit of the fur that's on the left-hand side of the dog so that I have that in place and ready to go. Then I can start kind of scrubbing in little bits of the shadow and carpet with a pencil. Then I'm going to go back through with a, uh, a Q-tip and start blending those out. Now I'm taking a brand new Q-tip for this one because I want to have a little bit more control over how I blend this in. And I pushed on the Q-tip uh, so that I could fatten it out a little bit. Because when you first get a Q-tip, they're wound pretty tightly. And so if you push on the top and kind of twist, uh, it will make the end of the Q-tip a little bit fluffier, a little looser, and then you can blend out a, a larger area. If you were to just take a regular Q-tip without doing that, you'll still be able to blend, but it will be blending in a much smaller, more compact area because the Q-tip is more compact. You're getting less surface area. So if you're ever in that situation where you're not sure why the Q-tip is too defined, um, fluff up your Q-tip a little bit by pressing on it, uh, twisting, kind of moving it around and getting it more like a cotton ball consistency rather than a Q-tip consistency. Now look how much that fur is glowing already just by dropping in the shadow, the very first layer of shadow here. Now. After I get that main part done with a pencil and I'm doing all that blending, I'm going to start to fade that shadow down a little bit with a Q-tip. So you can see how I pull it down and it starts to look blurrier along the edges. That's the biggest thing we need to keep in mind when we're doing this entire background is fuzzier is better as long as it's not the part that's hugging the edge of, of the dog. Now the reverse is going to happen here when we start talking about darkness. Um, when we were on the leg, we were talking about getting darker as you go down. On this particular shadow, we're going to get darker as we go up. Because the body is blocking more light at the base than it is um, outward. So we want to make sure that the base of this shadow along the dog's leg is darker where it meets the leg than it is at the bottom of the paper as you come forward. So I'm taking a lot of care right here to make sure that the darkness is at the level I want it before really moving on to the next section. Now we're also keeping in mind that I'm doing carpet. Now this isn't like a shag carpet, it's more, I don't know what you call it, Berber maybe? I've heard the word Berber before, I assume that's what I've got. <laughs> so, um, it's one of those carpets that isn't like fuzzy, it's more like a bunch of lumpy lines. And so what I'm doing is very quickly laying in a bunch of lumpy lines that go um, basically a bunch of them in a horizontal direction at sort of an angle. Then I will have some that go uh, more like a vertical at an angle. And I'm making sure that those little stripes 
get darker in a semi-uniform manner because we're not trying to mimic the carpet here we're just trying to give the idea of the carpet and I know that when I look at it that basically there's a bunch of lines that go one direction and a bunch of lines that go another direction so if I concentrate my shadows in the same basic way I can come up with a very uh, cheap and fast method to create the illusion of that carpet but we need to be consistent about it if we're doing it in the shadows we need to make sure that we're also doing it in the light we just need to be more selective about where those shadows go Now we can start laying in some very deep dark collars along uh, the bottom left and those are those lines I was just talking about. One thing I was told by another artist, I, I've never been formally trained so I don't know things without, uh, the, like the only things I know come from experimentation or, or talking to other artists. And one of the things she told me was the drawing or painting is usually more interesting if you have something different in all four corners. So that's one of the reasons that I like this shot. Because in one corner you have her mane on the bottom right corner. And it's just uh, non-detailed splotches to simulate fur. In the bottom left we're going to have a shadow that has a, a sort of defined darker shadows within it that are what makes up the carpet. So there's like a, a scrubbed in drawing look to that bottom left hand corner. The top left and the top right are also going to be out of focus shadows but they're going to be even less focused than what we're working on right here. So the the whole point of the drawing for me or the interesting parts of the drawing for me is going to be that when you look at it you're going to notice the dog's face right away then you're going to notice everything else looks like a camera shot where I've just focused on the face. Then if you keep looking at it, you'll notice that the corners are all out of focus and that the center of the drawing is in focus and that's done purposely in order to create uh, contrast mentally. So there's going to be contrast physically between shadows and light but there's going to be a mental contrast that happens too in comparing the focus to out of focus. My drawings are typically all about contrast, whether it be psychological or physical, and I try to incorporate that in everything I draw. Otherwise, I'm just attempting to be a human printer, and that's not really what I do. So while I'm, while I'm laying in this, I'd, I'd like to answer a question that I, I've gotten a lot and that I see on Reddit a bunch. And it's people who are either angry at realism type drawings or they don't understand why people do it. It's kind of a hard issue to address because the reason I do realism type drawings uh, is that it's a skill level I'm proud of and I like doing it and it keeps my mind focused. It's my genre of art. But also, when it comes to making money with art, I, I don't live in an area where abstract is appreciated. Um, that's more like a gallery thing or a larger city thing to where you can look at a, a piece of artwork and there's a statement behind it. Um, that's not really, I, I'm not big on making statements with my artwork. 
I live in an area where somebody wants to give me a few hundred dollars to draw their dog or uh, like there's there's one woman who approached me not long ago and her husband's father had passed away. She'd like a portrait done of him and that's that pays all my bills for the month. And so there's a practical reason why I, I learn realism in art. There's another reason why I, I practice with this type of an art genre as well. If I want to try a, a more abstract piece and I'm wanting it to represent something within the world, but just looking at it you know, through another lens, from another perspective, I find that it's easier to be able to pull that off if I know how to do and I have the skill set to do actual realism first. And so this is more like my baseline uh, that I can use if I attempt those other types of art. But when people ask, why do people attempt realism uh, honestly because we can uh, because it's something we enjoy and if you don't enjoy realism that's totally fine there's plenty of people out there who think that realism is just people trying to be you know a human printer and they they don't understand that um, there are plenty of people out there who do like realism and they know how hard it is because they've been in art classes before and they've attempted it and failed at it. And so there's not a ton of people out there who can pull off realism effectively. And so it's kind of like a magic trick. You know, I, I've i learned magic tricks and I wouldn't show somebody that every single time, you know, that I wouldn't show somebody that trick every single time they came over. But the first time they see it, they're like, oh my God, that was really cool. How'd you do that? It's kind of the same thing with realism in art. I understand that there's a lot of people out there who will look at what I'm doing right now and say, oh, that's kind of neat, and then never think about it ever again. And that is totally fine. But this is what I like to do, and I believe there's a lot of people out there who want to learn how to do this. And I think that learning a skill set like this can only benefit their other forms of artwork that they can do. There's never any drawback in my eyes to learning a new skill. Now you can start to see the carpet take shape here. There's, there's a, a long shadow that comes off of her leg here. And that means that the shadows within the carpet are going to be darker. Which is why I've got sort of a darker mid-gray that covers most of that area. And then these really dark splotches that cut across it. When you see this as a whole, especially whenever I get the upper section of the background done, you'll be able to look at that and your brain will immediately go, oh, that's carpet. Right now, it's you can see it, but it's a little hard to tell what it is um, because we don't have an overall piece to compare it to. Now that we've got even more of this carpet done, especially when we're differentiating between this dark shadow and that light section of the carpet that's on the left, now I'm going to go back through and make sure that all of this is blended together nicely so that it's smooth and doesn't have lumps of charcoal and light. And I'm going to make sure that it's dark enough because it needs to have a pretty sharp contrast between the side of that dog's fur and the background carpet. 
you'll notice again I pointed it out already but I want to point it out again as I darken this up notice how much more glowy the dog's fur gets on the left hand side it's starting to look like sunlight is hitting it from the back side rather than just a splotch of white fur it starts to look like light rather than white Now notice whenever I dropped in that light section of the carpet, it was too close to the uh, tone of the leg. And so to make sure that I differentiated between those two sections, I just dropped a very light, uh, soft shadow along the left-hand side of that leg. And so now it sticks out more and looks like she's on the carpet rather than in the carpet. It's just another layer of 3D that makes her pop out. Then once I get that tone the way I want it, now we can go back and blend that out a little bit more. So we're still doing layer refinement, layer refinement, but this is more about tone than about detail. So now that I have something to directly compare that to, I can go back into the dog's face and the dog's mane and start adding the shadows where they need to be so that it has its own background um, for the Tombow eraser to do its thing on because you're not going to have a solid block of light there you're going to have pretty bright section of light and then individual hairs are going to be even brighter than that so we need to have some sort of background there uh, for the Tombow eraser to work Now we're going to go back in and do exactly that. We're going to sharpen up some of these hairs and very quickly drop in some highlights. Make sure that we're overlapping that with the dark area that we've laid in before. It looks like I'm scrubbing. I'm not. I'm making single lines and I'm barely touching the paper when I do it. And I'm also going, uh, the, most of the lines I'm laying in from right to left because if I start in the middle and pull outward, the hairs will end at a point. If I start from the right and go to the left, the outside hairs will start with a flat base. So I'm very lightly dragging outward. And I'm going to do the same thing with the ear. I'm going to drag from the inside out, very short strokes, very light touch, and I'm pulling that into that dark, splotchy, black background. And those are going to look like individual hairs that come off of the dog's ear. I love doing this part so much that I'm seriously considering covering an entire piece of paper and nothing but flat black charcoal, as black as I can get it, 
and then doing an entire drawing with a Tombow eraser. I would go through so many refills by doing that, but I think it would be really cool looking. But don't hold me to that. There's a pretty good chance I will never, ever do that. Now this part I am scrubbing in. This is one of the few areas where I'm scrubbing. And the reason is because the hairs don't stick up from the dog's head. They stick up and curve backwards. Um, so it's going over the top of her head. If the hairs ended and we could see the ends of them, then I would make straight strokes upward. But since they curve over, they're more of a rounded look. And so I can achieve that by scrubbing uh, vertically as I go across the head. Now we need to make a big old decision. So we're going to load up that, uh, that Q-tip as dark as we can get it with as much charcoal as we can get in there. And we're going to start laying in some of those really dark shadows in the background. Now remember, these are the least detail out of everything in the entire drawing. So we can be a little bit careless here. The, the one thing we don't want to do though is make it super splotchy. Now remember it's going to be on that same rough carpet so we can put a little bit of splotch in there from time to time and it will naturally look like carpet texture. But for the most part we want to do these smooth um, and get them laid in and then kind of refine them a little bit later so we can control the splotches rather than having the Q-tip dictate those for us. Now these are really important to get extremely dark at their point of contact. So you can see at the top of that triangle that's really dark. Then that's going to fade as it gets closer to the dog because the base of whatever is making that shadow is blocking more light at the base than it is at the end of the shadow. And so we're making sure that we uh, mimic that when we drop in our shadow with charcoal. Now one thing that I'm noticing right now as um, I'm into this drawing, and when I say right now I mean as I was drawing it and not when I'm laying in the audio track. I'm looking at the shadow's tone and I'm also glancing down at the dog's body. The worst thing we could do here is make those two things the same exact tone. Because if we do, it's going to look flat, it's going to look 2D, and it's not going to look interesting. So I make a mental note here that I either need to get a lot lighter as I get toward the dog's body or I need to get a lot darker as I get toward the dog's body. So I bounce down to the, the body of the dog and I make a decision here too where the shadow is concerned. I decided that I wanted the shadow to be darker than the dog. So to make sure that I don't forget that, I start dropping in a line of shadow along the top part of the dog's body for a definite line of contrast. Now whenever I go back in and start laying in more and more of that shadow, I'm forced to reach that tone as I go down the paper. There's no way around it now because it exists on the drawing and now I have to make do with what I have and that keeps my brain on track and keeps me thinking all right, as I go down the drawing, I have to eventually reach that tone that's on the top of that dog's body with this shadow.
So as I'm working on this shadow, I also have to keep in mind that they're just like the bottom part of the drawing. There are shadows within shadows, uh, namely the little ridges that the carpet makes. So I'm going to add a couple of those in from time to time here and there. Another thing to keep in mind is that not every shadow is one solid gradient that comes down. In other words, not every shadow is just dark at the base and light at the furthest point. There is also light that comes in from different directions in the room. So maybe the walls are reflecting a bit of light back across the room uh, horizontally, um, horizontally across a vertical shadow. That's going to mean that part of that shadow is lighter in the middle than it is on the top or the bottom. And now there's no real way um, without just a ton of practice for you to know where and when and why that happens. My biggest suggestion here would be to just practice drawing tons and tons of things that have multiple points of light so that you can get used to the different gradients and the different uh, values that happen within shadows because sometimes you're going to have a shadow that lays across another shadow sometimes you'll have reflected light that breaks up a shadow in a really weird area um, but nailing those now will help you master realism because realism is all about uh, not just the fine details but all about mastering light and making light look real So in this particular one, th I, I believe this shadow gets lighter in the middle and darker along the edges. And so I'm working to make sure that, I, that this dark area that's along the top of the dog's body is darker, but not so dark that it looks like a defined line. So I'm doing lots of laying in the tones I want first and then blending them out with a q-tip um, to where they're not just blended and smooth but they they're fuzzy Now when you get to these backgrounds like this, it's going to be easy to start to lose motivation because it, it can be very tedious, especially when you're not working in detail. Uh, detail can grab your attention because you have to pay close attention in order to make the details stand out and look real. With a background like this, you're just trying to cover a ton of area. Uh, but whenever you're not putting in that detail, it becomes kind of mind numbing. Keep in mind that this section that I just did covers about, what, maybe a tenth of the paper. If you cut it just down to the background alone and don't count the dog, this one little shadow is taking up maybe uh, a fifth to a sixth of the paper, which means that I'm almost done. That's a massive amount of area that I just covered with this one big long block shadow. So part of what keeps me going and keeps me motivated is knowing that Every time I drop in one of these shadows and finish it, I'm that much closer to being done. This is a massive amount of progress here that's super easy to do. While I'm laying this in, uh, I want to give a quick shout out to some of our founding members of Midwest Guild of Fine Art. So I just want to say a quick hi to Jitters, Kev, Ron, uh, Leanna, Mr. Boldy, 
If you guys want a place to hang out and talk with other artists, um, these are some of the nicest people I've ever met. Uh, just go down to the description of this video. I will have a link on how to join our guild. If you click that link on that join page, I also have a link to the Discord. Joining the guild is free. Making the profile pages, it, it can be a little involved, but it, it's, it boils down to just know how to write an email. Um, if we start making money at one point, I can hire somebody to help automate the process. But right now, um, it's just sending me an email with all your work and answering some of the questions that's on the, the join page. I don't sell your information. Um, I don't make a dime off of any of this. This is just something I do because I wanted a group of nice, friendly artists to talk to. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to hang out with us, uh, the guild is free to join, or if you just want to join the, the Discord and have a place to chat with other artists, it's an open link. Feel free to come in and hang out with us. Once we get the membership built up a little more than it is right now, we'll start having events. Um, we'll start uh, doing a lot of promotion for other artists. That's a big thing I want the guild to do is make sure that we're promoting other artists and making sure that artists can make some money and get exposure. Um, again, totally free. I, it's just something that a lot of artists deal with. They don't know how to promote themselves. They don't know uh, what groups to join. They don't know what to charge for their work. We will tackle all that stuff in the guild. I want artists to know how to be artists, uh, both as a hobby and professionally. And the guild will be teaching how to do all that. You'll be talking to other artists who make a living off of their artwork. Um, as well as people who just do it for the fun of it. All right, let's really load up that scrap paper with a ton of charcoal this time because now we need to start defining a little bit uh, better shadows, a little darker shadows, because we're about to start bringing this whole thing together. We're going to start by defining some more shadows along the dog's mane because now we have a much larger area of comparison uh, to compare the dog's face and neck with the background. Since we have that direct comparison there, now we can tell that that part of the mane needs drastically darkened up. Not just darkened, but there are sections along the uh, almost the top of her mane where it goes into the glowy part of the fur, there needs to be a very dark contrast there. So that's the first thing I laid in. Then I'm going to go back through and darken and smooth a much larger section of that. And just by adding those shadows in very quickly, now it adds another layer of depth to the drawing. So now her head is starting to poke forward a bit rather than have a uh, a flat sort of look where the mane goes down in a single section and doesn't roll the way it's supposed to roll. Now very carefully I'm just kind of tapping and pulling 
because there's a small line of shadows that happens right outside of those glowy parts. Once I have that in place, now I can take the, the uh, blending stump or the smudge stick and I'm going to start putting in the shadows of, of individual hairs along the edge of that and that will make that pop out even more. So now it, it won't look just like one big blob of a, a glowing section. There are two sections there that glow and one's laid over the other. So I'm going to, I'm kind of stabbing outward from the shadows into the glowy parts so that those hairs will end in a point and kind of blend into each other. So they're not quite as defined. They sort of uh, uh, very minorly overlap. And the same thing in reverse. When we go from the shadows into those hairs on the left side where the mane goes into it, we're going to pull shadow into that glowy section. Now you can really start to see that that fur becomes a little more defined and looks more like hair. Um, that, like it looked like hair before, but it was a lot softer and a lot more out of focus. But now that we're defining the ends like this, it starts to look a little bit more detailed. Now, as I get down to the main on that, the bottom left hand side, I'm doing the same thing except I'm making fatter lines and I'm being a little bit more um, rough with the, uh, I'm, I'm more like I'm scratching it in and scrubbing it in rather than laying in individual hairs. Because that has less detail, I want it to still look rougher. So I'm very quickly scrubbing those in. Then you'll notice when I go back to the glowing sections of the, uh, the fur, then I'm a little more, well, I'm a lot more careful to make sure that that looks like hairs that are that have been painstakingly added in. We're giving the illusion that we worked a, a ton of time on this, when in reality we're just using a little bit of uh, trickery using blending stumps and q-tips. In order to avoid myself just spending tons and tons and tons of time on that, I got it to where I was happy with it, then I moved away. Don't spend a ton of time doing those refinements. I mean, you can, it's your drawing, uh, but I try to get to a point to where I'm happy with it and then move on to the places where I was progressing before. I'm getting back to the main focus and the main goal um, of my drawing on that particular day. So if that day or that hour I've decided I'm working on shadows on the upper section of the drawing, I make sure that I do my refinement where it needs to be, then get right back to that initial goal so that I don't feel like I'm losing progress. The more I get done on my goal, the more it feels like I'm doing what I set out to do, and that progress feels like accomplishment, which means the motivation sticks around longer. It's a good way to recharge yourself, get back to what you were doing. Now some beginner artists might ask, 
if I'm using like a perspective point, if I'm putting a point of light and then dropping the shadows from that point, if I were making this drawing up out of my head, out of my sheer imagination, it may be worth it to at least mentally place that point somewhere. Like the point of light, um, the, the source of the light in this particular drawing would be off the page somewhere. Um, but what I've done on this one, I'm using a reference photo, which is the way I do the majority of my drawings. I will use a reference photo and just mimic what is on that for the most part. Um, but after you've done enough of these drawings, you, you won't really need the perspective point anymore. It just kind of embeds in your head that this is the way light works. This is the way shadows work. And so it goes back to what I was explaining before about why I do uh, realistic style charcoal drawings because the more I do those, the more I understand about light and shadow and it just becomes uh, it just becomes a second nature. It's like a baseball player when the ball comes off of the bat, the outfielder doesn't stop and calculate the trajectory of the ball and the speed and the wind and, and all that. It's just the players played so much that they know from feel where that ball is, is going to land so they can get under it a lot easier. And it's the same thing with this you know, style of, of artwork. Practice, 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 draw everything you can, even if it's mundane stuff. Just practice drawing it just to learn how the shadows work. And then you could make something up like this off the top of your head without a reference photo and not have to get, you know, all geometry with it. You know, you, you, you don't have to plot a point and pull out strings and popsicle sticks or whatever you use to measure your perspective. You just know that this shadow goes this way and therefore all these other shadows in the drawing have to kind of conform to those rules. Now up here on the top left hand corner, there are a couple of things that aren't shadows and I don't remember what these are. I think one is like a cabinet and like a shelf that's sticking out. I'm doing something that if, if I were working on this drawing for let's say 80 hours to try to make it really realistic, I probably would not be using the pencils here. I would probably be putting in several layers of uh, charcoal with the Q-tip. But this is only like a five hour drawing. I think it's five or six hours total that I spent on this whole thing. And so in order to get this upper left hand section done faster, I'm kind of cheating uh, my, my regular style by drawing these in or laying them in with pencil first and then scrubbing all that and blending it together with Q-tips. This is purely a speed thing because I just didn't feel like layering a ton of, of uh, Q-tip charcoal on top of Q-tip charcoal. Uh, the one thing I am adhering to is the edges of these need to be very, very fuzzy. And so I'm pulling that shadow or the, the black splotches directly into the shadows that they give off so that it's very, very blurry. Now you, you might be asking why I normally wouldn't use pencils. Um, the reason is because it's going to look grainy. Now it'll look even grainier on video than it is in real life because the, the video camera I'm using is just my phone. And the phone has software that tries to sharpen up images and tries to add focus to them. And that distorts a lot of the detail uh, that you'll get in a drawing. Uh, so for instance, this dog in real life, the actual drawing itself, looks less sharp than the way the video uh, presents it. And so it actually looks more realistic in real life than what it does on this video. Um, it does the same thing with this black area that I'm working on right now. The pinholes that pop through the black are accentuated because of the video but they still also exist in real life. So if I don't want those pinholes and I don't want the pencil stroke marks to be on there, uh, I wouldn't use a pencil at all here. I would use just charcoal, just Q-tip, and layer it until I was happy with it. 
but doing that on this particular drawing would turn a five or six hour project uh, into you know easily 20 30 40 hours i could spend 100 hours on this drawing and make it look more and more realistic the more time i put into it but that's not really what i'm going for here To give you an idea of how realistic we can get, here's a drawing that I did of Ian McKellen as an example of my skill level uh, for an art show that I did uh, a few months back. This took roughly about 80 hours to do. And if we wanted, we could give the drawing that I'm working on now, the dog drawing, an equal amount of realism. But if we're doing a tutorial video on how to draw realistically, Let's start off with something like this that we could do in five or six or seven hours or whatever, and then work up to something that's a little bit more defined and more realistic. That way we're not going from zero to a hundred in, in one video. Uh, let's, let's set ourselves some goals and let's work up to that. Let's get the basics down with this drawing first. Then we can move on to something that's more detailed and more detailed and we can work our way up to things like hyperrealism. I don't even know what this section is I'm working on now. It may have been a curtain or a plant base or something. The point is I'm so unconcerned about detail in this background that all I'm really worried about is getting the most basic shapes dropped in and then blended out so that the background has something there, but it's not a focal point. The entire existence of this background, the entire purpose of it, is to make the dog's face look more realistic by comparison. If I were to just draw the dog's head and the dog, dog's face, I could cut the paper down to fit that and make that the central focal point of the drawing, and it would be fine. There's a lot of people who would be happy with that. But if you drop in a background that's blurry like this, and you can tell basically what the, the shapes are in the background, and you can tell there's a lot of shadow, and it's really, really blurry, then psychologically, the viewer is going to view that dog's face as more detailed than what it actually is just by having a point of comparison. The dog's face on its own would be enough to, for like an average viewer to say, oh wow, that's cool. But adding the background on, on it makes enough of a psychological impact for them to up that reaction to like, holy crap, like how did you pull that off? Um, and I've, I incorporate that into almost every type of drawing that I do. I love doing multiple layers of focus. That's kind of my thing because it adds another layer of realism without me having to put more detail into the realistic, sharp, detailed parts of it. It's really weird to think about it, that you're actually adding detail to a drawing by putting in things that are way less detailed. It's almost bizarre to think about.
Now, one thing I'm keeping an eye on while I'm doing this background is making sure that I don't have any lines that are too defined. So if I notice that I've got, you know, vertical lines that are coming down and that they're too sharp, I'm going to go back through with a Q-tip and fuzz those by just blending their edges. And the way I do that is I just scrub the edges in little circular motions to make sure that it fades into the background rather than sticks out against the background. Now you can see here I got one line that had too much, there was too much charcoal on the, uh, the Q-tip. So I'm just using a kneaded eraser to lift that out a little bit because I don't want to erase it clear back down to paper. I just want to lighten it up enough to where it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb. And as I've mentioned in other videos, the kneaded eraser works really well because it doesn't damage the paper as it's lifting off the charcoal. If I were to take the Tombow eraser and do the same thing, I would, it would take off so much pencil that it would bring you right back down to paper again, and then that would jut out as a very defined line of, of white. Now, don't get too caught up in the details of, of the background when you're doing something that's this blurry. So what I mean by that is, let's say that the upper left hand section is a file cabinet, which is what it kind of looks like to me. If I thought about it too much, I would be, I would be telling myself, I need to make that look more like a filing cabinet and less like a blob. And then I would start adding in too much detail and destroy everything about it that makes it blurry. Lay those things in, get your shadows laid in, and don't worry too much about the details because you can destroy that effect. I, I don't know what's causing most of these shadows back here, but I know they exist. I know they go in a, a specific direction. And so all I'm doing is quickly laying those in, getting them the tone that I want, 
and then leaving them alone. Yeah, my brain naturally will look at something like this and, and go, well, what's causing this shadow? And then I have to tell myself, doesn't matter. It exists. Lay it in, leave it alone, move on. Don't know what's causing it, but it's there. So let it be. And if you start to feel like you're burning out or it's too tedious or you're losing motivation, now's a good time to kind of step back and look at the overall piece and realize half of this background is already done. You've covered so much area that you're, you're uh, sprinting toward the finish line right now. While I'm laying this in, uh, it's kind of a good idea too to look at what we're doing and notice how this is mostly just basic background shadows, right? Glance down at the carpet below the dog's uh, haunches and all of a sudden that looks like detailed carpet. All we did was add just a few little splotches of, of shadow that run horizontally and vertically but compared to what we're doing right now, the bottom left-hand section of this drawing actually looks like that type of carpet. Always keep that in mind whenever you're doing a, a piece in realism, that everything looks detailed by comparing it to something else. The eyes of this dog look extremely detailed because it's right next to an undetailed white splotch of fur. The fur on the top of the dog's nose, right on the snout, looks more detailed like individual hairs because, again, it's beside a large white section that doesn't have a lot of detail there. So it makes it look like I've painstakingly drawn in a bunch of individual hairs. Use that psychological um, comparison, that psychological trick that happens to your advantage. Now notice the, the one thing I'm making sure that I do up here in this area is with these minor shadows, I'm making sure that my strokes are all going in the same direction because the, the shadows seem to come from one point where they fan outward at, at different angles. As long as the strokes that I'm doing, even in areas that don't have shadow, follow that direction then it gives the light more legitimacy. It looks like the light flows. We're using the same principle that we used when we made the fur. We're making sure it flows in the right direction. So those strokes, even though most people aren't going to notice the strokes themselves, overall they will get a sense of that direction because all the lines are uniform and going the same way.
Now we're just going back up into that white area and giving it some more definition by blocking in some more gray and blending it in with the other shadows. And again, notice the direction of the strokes that I'm taking. It would be easy to, to do the circular motion or to try to pick whatever is more comfortable to you. For, so for instance, like um, if it's more comfortable for you to shade horizontally, you would be tempted to do that. But since the shadows are flowing from a single point, a, a single light source, we're reinforcing that idea of shining light by keeping those strokes going the same direction. Now when I've loaded up the Q-tip this time, I loaded it up with a ton of charcoal. So I have to be very, very careful when dropping in the shadows that are right next to the dog's upper uh, part of its body. So notice how as I'm laying it in, it's a lot darker than what it normally would be with a Q-tip. It's because I've got so much charcoal on there that I've got to be careful. So I'm using ultra light strokes to lay that in in the beginning. Then as more charcoal gets pulled off of the Q-tip, I can increase the pressure on my scrubbing and I can increase the speed and the amount of strokes that I'm using. Because at that point there's less charcoal on it, which means that I've got more leeway on how much is coming off. So notice right there in that shadow, a ton of that charcoal came off in that one little section. I did that in an area that I knew was going to be darker and needed a, a splotch. So it's less risky for me to put that dark charcoal there and then fix it and turn it into other things later. I'm starting off in a safe area that requires more uh, darker charcoal. And now we have more points of comparison. So I can go back to the original shadow that we laid in and start to darken that up a little bit. Because I've noticed that compared to the new shadow that we laid in in the dead center upper part of the page, uh, the original one, the big triangle looking one, wasn't quite dark enough.
and then by comparing the shadow to the actual floor itself, I noticed the floor was way too light. So again, using that point of comparison, I can go back and know that this needs to be darkened. And while I'm in that area, we might as well go ahead and do that touch up, then move on. Then we go right back into laying in the background, um, which is the base color or the base tone of the floor itself. So I'm just blocking out a very large section so that we have it done and we can get that feeling of progress and accomplishment to keep pushing me to finish this drawing. So now I want to start defining the edge of the dog's head versus the background. So I'm going to take a Q-tip and start laying in some of the carpet directly above her head. Now remember, this is a section of the carpet that just like the lower left-hand section has little ridges and little uh, places where horizontal shadows are, are, are going to pop out. So all I'm doing is I defined a section of shadow above her head so that I could get an idea of how dark or how light to make this section of the drawing. And then I added in a few ridges, then I popped back up to what I was doing before, which was that really dark, weird shaped shadow right in the middle of the, the upper section of the drawing. And I'm gonna start working my way down and blocking in a very large section of this background so that we at least have a base to work off of. The more of this I get filled in now, the more progress it feels like we've made. And that's important as an artist to, to keep yourself motivated constantly because I know so many artists just go on Reddit right now and look in the drawing section or they, they have a section called the uh, Artist Lounge. If you go in there, you find post after post after post from people saying, they're not motivated. They've lost the will to draw or paint. Um, they don't, they can't force themselves to finish a piece. And it's because there are sections of, of drawings and paintings of any creative work that is honestly just boring to do. This background is not exciting, but I know that when I finish it, it will make the rest of the drawing exciting by comparison. Forcing yourself through the boring parts is, it's the hard part. It's the part where you have to, you know, grab yourself by the straps and pull up your freaking boots and just draw the damn thing. Like, get it done. And, and really, you have to treat your, your brain like it's a toddler. You have to trick it into thinking that you're progressing and that the thing that you're doing is almost done. You have to constantly reassure yourself, I'm, I'm so close to finishing, let's just get this done, let's cross the finish line.
Now we can pop back down to the head again and start to define that a little bit more. And this is yet another motivation thing for me. I can directly see how this background is affecting the head if I'm dropping in these sections that are right up against the head. And so for me, that feels like a reward and yet another piece of accomplishment. So it's a way to keep my brain rewarded for doing the thing that I'm doing. When I see how that fur pops out against what I'm scrubbing in, that feels good. Now this shadow that I'm adding in right there is not necessarily a shadow that may exist in the original reference photo, but I needed something there to break up some of that white in the background. And I, I understand that the majority of the background is not white, it's actually gray. But I needed a darker splotch in order to add some sort of interest there. It doesn't have to be much, just enough to break up that area a bit. And I think that's a, a part of drawing that amateur artists and hobbyists don't really take into effect. They don't care as much about the edges as they do the center of the drawing. Now the center is obviously the focal point, so yes, you wanna, you wanna pay attention to that more so than you do the rest of the drawing. But remember that the eyes are gonna wonder. People are gonna scrutinize the drawing. People are going to look at it for more than a couple seconds. Uh, and so having points of interest that break up the monotony of the background are good things. And again, you don't have to put them everywhere. Having little splotches, little extra shadows, little pieces that break up the monotony on that background adds almost a weird sort of action to the, the shot. So now I'm at a point in the background where the carpet is going to start to come into a little bit more detail. And so you'll notice I'm making those circular scrubbing motions and I'm doing them horizontally and leaving a little bit of light area. And that's where the carpet's starting to catch the light and become textured. So I don't want a totally flat gray here. I need... Uh, the ridges to start to make an appearance as we get closer to the dog's head, as we get further down toward the middle of the drawing. And I also need to remember that those ridges don't just go horizontally, they also go vertically. So I need to start dropping a few of those in from time to time too. We're not going to drop a ton of those in this section of the drawing though. We're going to be very loose with them and only pick out a few areas where we're going to put um, the ones that are a little bit more defined. And those act just like the shadow that we dropped on that right hand side, the little splotchy shadow. They are there to add texture and they're there just as importantly to break up the monotony of the background.
Now I'm starting a brand new section on my scrap paper where I'm scrubbing in more charcoal and the reason is because after a while of scrubbing in that same one area um, that's on the left hand side I'm destroying the teeth of the paper there and the paper is not going to pick up as much charcoal and it's not going to hold as much charcoal. Now printer paper is very very thin and it's very uh, smooth so the teeth you don't notice them as much but they are there little divots in the paper. Once those are totally destroyed and the paper is really really flat you can still put charcoal on it, but the paper won't hold on to the charcoal as much, meaning uh, that you, the little splotch that you make won't last as long. So every once in a while, it's worth it to start a brand new splotch that you can start working your Q-tip into. You notice there I just pulled the q-tip through that one time and then I still had to uh, clean the q-tip off by scrubbing it on the scrap paper in another area otherwise I'd have too much charcoal on it. Now I'm dropping in a pretty big base shadow here in the background and I'm doing it in little horizontal layers so that the the carpet starts to have a bit of texture back there as well. Now one thing you'll notice, and this is totally an artistic decision on your part, notice how the file cabinet on the left hand side tilts at like a weird angle. That's because that's the way it was in the reference photo. So in order for the dog to look like she was laying on a flat surface and she was nice and centered, I had to tilt the image of the dog itself to be in a position that I wanted her to be in. And that meant that the background was at a weird angle too. Now, if that bothers you, you can just cut that part off of your, your drawing and just stop you know, a few inches above the dog's head and, and you're done. I actually like the way that's tilted because to me it looks more, I don't know, rough and real life. It looks like somebody snapped a quick photo of their dog and they didn't care that the the background wasn't perfectly horizontal. I like that aspect of the the shot. It's one of the, one of the reasons why I decided to draw this specific shot rather than one of the other, you know, 200 photos or whatever my wife has of, of this dog. Now I'm just going back up to these little splotches I made earlier that represent the little ridges, the carpet and shadows, and I'm making sure that I blend those out a lot. I want absolutely no hard edges on these at all. I need those to be super, super fuzzy. So I'm using small circles to blend them from the dark areas into the light areas, and the more I do that, the fuzzier it looks. Now I'm just going to drop some more shadows in at that same angle and I'm blending it up into like one, I don't want to say solid area, I'm kind of blending it into one solid shape, but I'm increasing and decreasing the pressure on the Q-tip in order to lay in little ridges as I'm scrubbing. So rather than just laying a ridge one at a time, I'm kind of doing the whole thing in one motion. I'm scrubbing in a whole big area and then using the pressure of the Q-tip to uh, let it take off little uh, defined areas of carpet. They're, they're not strong, they're very subtle because if I 
am putting in like a whole bunch of small ridges there and I'm making them too dark and too defined, it destroys the illusion of an out of focus background. The other thing that I'm doing is I'm making sure that this corner is a little bit darker than the rest of the background because it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in having the four corners of the drawing itself have uh, interesting yet different things in each corner. So in other words, the filing cabinet that's in the upper left hand corner looks better barely being in frame than if I were to just drop an almost duplicate version of the shadow in the upper right hand corner. If I have that shadow making an appearance in both corners, then it starts to make the background look boring. Now I'm going right into the middle of this white section and I'm picking a few places where I want the shadows uh, and the sort of divots in the carpet and the carpet texture. I want those to be darker in select areas so that they break up that big field of uh, white and, and eventual grays that are going to be dropped in here. I want to do that now because it mentally prepares me uh, for knowing what areas need to be broken up and which ones don't. So it gets me mentally prepared for whenever I fill in the entire background to know where I can kind of go a little bit lighter on my strokes and allow some of that white paper to bleed through. Now there I thought it was a little too dark so I just twisted some of that off with a kneaded eraser and then very very lightly with a q-tip I just blended in the the edges of that because when you twist off charcoal and you I say twist off but it's when you lift off charcoal um, you'll have an actual defined edge where the eraser was so all we did uh, with the q-tip was go back and smooth out those eraser marks. And now from here on out, basically everything that I lay in, I'm not just looking at the area that I'm scrubbing in. I'm looking at that and also the other stuff that I've laid in. So that I'm constantly giving myself points of comparison 
and fixing and tweaking. And uh, like in this particular section, I'm making that background blob fuzzier and more out of focus. So even here where I'm dropping in a l another splotch in the background, I'm also glancing up at the other shadows and reminding myself uh, to fix or darken or lighten certain areas in comparison to where I'm working now. That's hard to keep in mind. Um, whenever you're doing a detail drawing like this, it can be easy to get lost in the details and to not look at your piece as like an overall work of art. So it's really important that, especially as you're getting toward the end of a, a piece like this, that you're looking at the entire drawing and seeing how it works as a, a cohesive whole. So for instance, if I back up and I look at this drawing just as an overall work, I notice that the right hand side of it is a little bit too light for me. There's not enough going on to justify even having that section in there. And the way I get around that is by adding some clumps of shadows and by adding some texture and adding a few more little strips of uh, charcoal that go across that area. It breaks it up, it adds a little bit of a point of interest, and it defines the overall piece, and it makes it feel like the dog's in a room rather than just sitting against a generic background. Just because we don't have a lot of detail in this background doesn't mean that we shouldn't focus on like the overall shapes, because those overall shapes matter. I've talked to many artists over the years who are pretty good artists, but they get to a point like this and they're having to make decisions about the background that may exist in the original photo and the reference photo or may not. And they put so much work and time and effort into it that they're afraid of messing up the drawing. And I, it's a mindset you have to get out of because most things that you do on a drawing are fixable. And if they're not fixable, you can morph those into other things. So if I got a splotch of charcoal on this area of the drawing, my goal would be to not erase that off the page or, or say that it ruined the drawing. It would be to try to blend that into the rest of the background in a cohesive way to where it's not as noticeable or it becomes a point of interest. It becomes a functional part of the drawing. So. I don't know how to get yourself out of that mindset of being afraid to ruin a drawing. Um, you have to allow yourself room to fail in something like this. If I did something on this drawing right now that totally ruined it, I have to be okay with the idea that I've, wa that I've quote unquote wasted the time. Um, because I don't think it is a waste of time. I think that making a mistake right now, even one big enough to completely ruin the drawing, is a lesson that you could not have learned without that experience. So my point is, don't be afraid of taking risks 
And if you think something needs to be added to the drawing, especially like in a background like this, just add it. And if it works, that's great. And if it doesn't, figure out how to fix it or be okay with that idea. Uh, because you need to have the confidence to know that if you lay something into the drawing, it has to have a purpose. And you have to, to know that you have the ability to lay that in and be fine with the result. I used the, the trick here that we talked about in another video too, where I wanted to smooth out some of that black along those cabinets in the upper left. And I knew that by doing that, it would dirty up the Q-tip quite a bit and make the strokes that I'm going to use darker because there's more charcoal on it now that I lifted off of that other area. So I used that to my advantage and went back into the background and started laying in more and more ridges with that. Now here's a neat little trick. I am taking a paper towel and I've not ran it through the dark, dark charcoal that's on that uh, scrap paper. I've ran it across all the other dirty parts in order to slightly dirty that up. Then you notice that I kind of smudge it down on the clean parts of that paper to take some of the charcoal off. And now I'm just going into the drawing and I'm scrubbing it in, in circles in order to sort of dirty up the background. And that, and that adds a large section of gray that cuts down the amount of time that I'm spending blending in that carpet and laying in uh, mid-tones and, and soft tones in that background. The other thing it does is all those little areas where I've got little ridges of carpet coming up and the areas where I've got um, lines that are too defined like with the filing cabinet with that big triangular shadow it blurs them even more than what they were before and so this is another area where you can't be afraid to do this um, go back in and just make a decision and do it because the overall effect that it gives it takes out so many of the scrub marks and it it blurs up the shadows so much more than they were before that it makes your drawing look like it goes even further into the background. It makes it even deeper than what it was before. Now I'm getting a really dark section and I'm gonna go back into the bottom left hand corner and blur that even more to take out some of the details that I thought were a little too fine. When people get nervous to make a decision and do something like this, when they start thinking that it's risky and they start to doubt the method, they're not doubting the method, they're doubting their skill level. Don't doubt your skill level. Even if you're not a great artist, you will get better by doing things like this, by making a decision, following through on it, and learning how to use that method. You're never going to get good at charcoal if you don't use charcoal. You're never going to get good with this little paper towel method if you don't try it out. So don't be afraid of ruining a, a drawing. Dive in and do your thing. Be confident about it and see how it works. If you're not comfortable doing it on a drawing that you're this far into, um, grab a scrap piece of paper and try it out on there. See what it does. Learn how to manipulate that, that material. Because right here, what I'm doing with that little triangular shadow, I'm darkening that up by quite a bit. And I'm, I'm doing it in a way that leaves it fuzzy. And I'm doing it in a way that doesn't take me an hour to do now. It's one big overall sweeping method to do the background.
Now, since we just took off a ton of that, that charcoal, we're going to reload the paper back up with a, a ton more soft charcoal and go back in with a Q-tip and, and reload that again. Because now we need to go back into things like the ear and pick out some spots that need darkened because comparing it to the background that we just laid in, it looked a little, I don't know, monotone. It looked a little flat. So we can fix that by getting a, a heavy load of charcoal on a Q-tip and just kind of sporadically dropping in shadows that are not really smooth. They're a little on the lumpy side. They've got more of a stroke look to them. And that in turn will make that look like clumps of hair that are, are all bound together to make shadows. And now we can go back into the rest of the dog's face and do the same thing, um, adding in little areas that make it a little darker in specific areas so that it doesn't look as flat. The difference that the, those little touch-ups make is phenomenal. It really starts to turn this drawing into more of a 3D object. It gives the illusion of a, a 3D curves and, and deeper shadows. And And now, just like with all the rest of the parts that we've done on this drawing, there are so many more points of comparison now than there were before. We have an entire page worth of comparison points. So now I can go back in to like the dog's eyes, parts of her cheek, and compare it to the background and say, well, this tone is too much like this other section. So let's darken this up and define it and make it stand out more. Let's differentiate this section from the rest of the drawing so that it pops out. And you really have to be confident in this part too because we're using some pretty heavy charcoal here. So if we get this on here and we overdo it, it's way harder to remove that charcoal than it is to add charcoal in. Um, but we can't really do it with a super delicate touch. I can't go in there and just add little layers at a time in order to get to that darkness point that I want. I have to have the confidence to get in there load up that q-tip pretty heavy and then have confidence in the strokes that i'm putting on um, so that i can get this done in some sort of timely manner without having to build up to it
Now, even when we're going back into this area above the dog's eye, uh, part of what we're doing here is we're darkening that a little bit to make that splotch of fur stand out a bit more. But we're also using these long strokes in order to define and give the, the viewer an idea of how long those hairs are. So I, I couldn't tell you how long they are in inches. I just know that they're roughly a little bit bigger than her eye. And so I'm making sure that as I'm darkening those, I'm taking wider strokes to define how long those hairs are. Then the other part that I'm comparing is the whiteness of the fur to the actual light glowy parts of the fur. Because again, there's a difference between white fur and light. So in order for those glowy parts to look glowy, there needs to be, uh, the white doesn't need to be pure white, it needs to be more of a gray tone. And so I'm blocking that in with a paper towel and with Q-tips. So now even though we psychologically, even though we mentally know that her fur is white, in reality, we've changed that to a very light shade of gray. Then when we compare it to the actual white paper, which is the parts that are the light is glowing really strongly, it tricks our brain into thinking that that section is uh, saturated in light. And now that we have that, the paper towel thing, you know, to, to block in all that gray area. We can go back in and start adding in those little fine hairs again along the top of the head. And those are now going to stand out uh, dramatically compared to how they looked before. Because we not only got the background gray to, uh, to give a point of contrast, but we have the white fur that's been modified to a very light tone of gray. And by comparison, it will make these marks look way whiter than they actually are. We do the same thing with a little V-shaped section of her, the top of her head. We're pulling white hairs into that. And now, as you can see, we're starting to really fine tune things. We're going just back through the stuff we've already done. We're adding highlights. We're adding more stray hairs. We're making it look more like fur um, with every one of these strokes that we're doing.
And now to add in her little whiskers, some of her whiskers are white and some of those whiskers are black. And so I started in by adding one long hair that comes out on the left hand side with a Tombow eraser. Then I'm going to take a, I think it's hard, yeah, it's hard charcoal. And I'm going to make one swoop that goes off to the right on the right hand section. And I'm moving my whole hand whenever I do that. I'm not just moving my fingers because if I'm moving my entire hand all in one um, stroke, the lines won't be as wiggly or wavy, at least for me. That's the way that I can control those strokes better. I also let, I don't hold the pencil close to the end, uh, toward the operational end. I hold it toward the butt. And I couldn't explain the science behind it. I just know that whenever I do that and I move my whole hand, the lines are smoother and less wiggly. I also don't make all the whiskers the same um, weight. So some of those whiskers are going to be darker than others. There's a few of them that I added that are so light you can barely even tell they're there. Even in real life, you can't tell that they're on the drawing. They're really, really subtle. All right, we're in the home stretch now, down to the last couple minutes, and this thing will be ready to sign. And I would normally seal this with uh, a fixative. Uh, they, they call it a fixative. It's, like, it's almost like a clear spray paint, like a varnish. And you do that so that the charcoal gets fixed to the paper and won't smudge as much. Uh, but this particular one I'm not going to fix because we may come back to this like maybe a year down the line or something. But... Anyway, for right now, we're making final touch-ups, and what I'm doing is taking that dirty towel again and pulling some of those shadows along with the flow of the light. And that way, I'm darkening up the carpet back there, and I'm maintaining the integrity of the direction of the light. Now, along the edges, I'm doing more circular motions because I want to blend that in and kind of diffuse those edges a little bit. Um, and it just makes it you know, for lack of a better word, artsy. <laughs> I mean, it looks dirty and it looks a little rough, but I kind of like that look. We're also paying special attention to the edges of the paper here too, making sure that we overlap those strokes going from the inside paper to the outside toward the table so that we don't have light sections along the, uh, the borders of the paper. Otherwise it just looks weird. So in other words, we're, when we do those strokes on, on the outside edge, we're going totally off the paper in order to make that work. Then we're uh, separating out those two mains by doing another little charcoal uh, scrubby paper towel thing on the bottom right hand corner. Uh, just very quickly just to give it another layer of shadow underneath that first roll of the first main. Now we're just doing the final touch-ups, uh, which is on this cheek, which has bothered me through the entire drawing. Clear back to the very first video that we did, I'm finally getting to that area and darkening that up the way I think it needs to be darkened. We don't want it totally black, but we want it way darker than what it was, at least um, just darn near double in value.
Now, if I wanted to make this look totally realistic, when we get into things like hyper-realism and all that, number one, I'd spend 100 hours on it, which I'm not willing to do. Uh, that's not what this drawing was about. And two, I would make the shadows on the left side of her face, our, our left, her right, I would make those way, way, way darker. Because in the original photo, uh, the reference photo, it's way darker. But as I explained in, in previous videos, um, I'm not wanting an exact duplication. I wanted the contrast changed on certain parts of her face in order to bring out details. And so I lightened up the shadows on that left-hand side quite a bit in order uh, for that fur to pop out a little bit better. I just like it better that way. If we wanted to you know, get into even more photorealism, we'd spend the next hour or two adjusting uh, the entire left-hand side of her face. Uh, but that's not, again, that's not what we're doing here. That's not what I'm going for. But as you can see, just scrubbing in just a little bit darker areas um, in select spots on that cheek does make it pop out better. It makes it a little more 3D. It makes it a little more photo-like. But then when you do that, by comparison, then the spots and the general shadows on her snout start to look a little bit odd, so you have to adjust those two. So remember, when you make major adjustments like this, like adding a big shadow, you do need to look at the rest of the drawing and figure out how that shadow affects everything else. And that is about it. Uh, barring just a couple touch-ups here and there, very, very minor stuff, that is the drawing. So I mentioned that I normally spray this down with a uh, charcoal-specific fixative. I'm not going to do that with this one because we can take what we have right here. And if we decide to, let's say in a few months or a year or whatever, if we decide to, we can make this look even more realistic. We could put in double, triple, quadruple the amount of time and make this drawing look like the base of a better drawing. Right now it looks realistic enough for me. It would be what I would be happy with if I bought a commission or I sold this as a commission. But if we really wanted to take the time to put detail in, we could and make this look more and more and more photographic the more time we put into it. But that said, that's how to draw a realistic dog uh, in charcoal. Thank you so much for watching, and again, if you are interested in joining the Totally Free Art Guild, I will have links to that in the description, as well as the Patreon. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, it would be much, much appreciated. We can get some better cameras, better audio. But thank you so much. My name is Adam O, and I will see you in the next tutorial.